Azerbaijan Grand Prix with a tyre failure just a few laps from the end. History's repeated itself in 2021 and this year it's Verstappen. And we think it's the left rear tyre again. Verstappen had this race in his hands. What will you do for recognition and leadership? What if I tell you that the result doesn't always depend on effort you made? Formula 1, one of the careless sports. It doesn't forgive mistakes. There is no limit to past victories. Formula, like a woman, is changeable and therefore prestigious. The biggest companies in the world are fighting for the opportunity to be sponsored, to show themselves, to please the formula and please its recalcitrant nature. What can we say about drivers who often find themselves in the technological trap of brands, regardless of their talents? Imagine that your every movement is under the control of a puppeteer who pulls the strings just for the colorful performance. Winning one race doesn't guarantee the championship, and each race is lottery of random events, weather conditions. And what is the most affected by weather conditions? That's right, tires. So, what if tires in Formula 1 are the main factor in winning? And has it always been like this? Modern Formula 1 racing tires wear out too quickly, require extremely precise aerobatic and explode right during the race. But once the drivers could drive several Grand Prix on one set of tires. Modern Formula 1 engineers are convinced that the tires are the most important part of a racing car. However, at the dawn of the World Cup, the situation was the opposite. In fact, all that was required of the wheels was that they be round. It's hard to imagine, but the tires of the time didn't differ much from the road modifications. At the moment, engine speed was valued much more than the abstract coupling properties. The same set of tires was used in several Grand Prix, and the teams keep changing tire brands during the course of the season. A driver could easily start a championship on a Dunlop, continue on a Continental, and finish on an Engelbert. In the end, it all came down to the price and performance of each type. Yeah, they didn't think about marketing at that time. From the point of view of a modern person, motorsport tires of the 50s look more like bicycle wheels than full-fledged racing tires. The tires were narrow and tall with small sidewalls. They were made from natural rubber and had little wear resistance. And, of course, the similarity wasn't without reason. In 1832, before the automobile existed, in a place called clermont ferrand in central France, cousins Aristide Barbier and Edouard Dobre opened a small factory for the production of agriculture machinery and rubber products. And another 57 years passed until in May 1889 the grandchildren of Arisette Barbier, Edwards and André Michelin transformed a small family workshop into a company that soon became the largest not only in clermont ferrand but throughout the province of Auvergne. On a spring day in 1889, a team of buffalo crowded into the yard of Michelin factory in clermont ferrand delivering to the workshop an unlucky cyclist, who punched one of the newest tires from the English company Dunlop, an air-filled rubber tube covered with a protective cloth. The recently invented pneumatic tires by John Dunlop had one terrible flaw. English tires were tightly glued to the wooden rim of the wheel, so in the event of a puncture without proper equipment and modest 60-page manual, it was impossible to fix a problem. For three hours, French workers put rubber patches in his tire. Another night went to dry, but all the work went to ash. The patch Dunlop couldn't stand even a hundred meters. Then the naturally inquisitive Edward decided to approach the problem from the other side and eradicate its very essence. Michelin and his engineer Laroche spent two years on technical research until in the summer of 1891 Michelin and company finally received patent for the production of a revolutionary novelty – removable pneumatic tires. 
However, it's curious that the lovers of this novelty are received not by Michelin, but by Goodyear. Yeah, Michelin at the time specialized in bicycle tires and put their removable bicycle tires on cars. While Goodyear broke into the automotive industry, and in 1904 the manufacturer introduced the world's first removable tire. The invention made the young company famous all over the world. Henry Ford didn't hesitate to choose Goodyear as the official tire supplier for the first mass produced car. And there is no secret that in the automotive industry, motorsport and record breaking races have always been considered a symbol of success and leadership. While the path to Michelin's earlier racing success was rocky, Goodyear tires succeed here as well. In the 1960s, more attention began to pay to the rubber. Engineers learned that the larger the contact patch of the tire, the better grip it provides. An additional load was provided by new regulations. In 1966, 3-liter engines returned to Formula 1. The displacement of motors has doubled, and the requirements for tires have also increased. Now racing cars are more like spawning powder spawning on the asphalt. The powder for vehicles have continued for a long time if something completely new hadn't appeared in Formula 1. The first truly epical event in the history of racing rubber was the appearance of slicks. Tires with a large contact patch, which was ensured by absence of a tread pattern. These were the first exclusively racing tires. You cannot put such tires on a road car, because on wet track slicks cannot drain water and completely load their grip, which means that if it rains, the tires will have to be changed. It's unlikely that the owners of civilian cars are ready for this. Such rubber was used in drug racing back in the 50s and 60s, but only reached Formula 1 in the 1971 season. And, of course, who could boast of such an innovation as Goodyear? By the way, disputes still don't subside when the first lift appeared in Formula 1. Goodyear passionately argued at the 1971 French Grand Prix, but Firestone sure at 1971 Spanish Grand Prix. Let's dwell on the fact that we saw slicks in 1971 and one of the main supporters of slick rubber was the three-time world champion, the legendary Jackie Stewart. Yeah, victory in the 1971 season went to Goodyear. The Constructors' Championship was won by their Tyrell clients and Jackie Stewart became the champion. However, in addition to the mention of slicks, it's worth nothing that perhaps it was Goodyear who influenced the appearance of real Formula 1 cars. There have been at least four six-wheel cars in the history of Formula 1, but only one of them went to the start and even won races. We are talking about the Tyrell P34, perhaps the most recognizable Formula 1 car of all time. The car appeared in 1976, becoming a logical reflection of current design traits at that time. By getting rid of huge front wheels, the front of the P-34 made it possible to smooth out the airflow and increase downforce. Two 10-inch front tires instead of one 13-inch provided a larger total footprint. This car managed to win several podiums and even won one race. Jody Schechter won the 1976 Swedish Grand Prix, but in the future the results began to decline, largely due to the rubber. Goodyear just didn't want to spend money developing small tires for one team. If the Americans nevertheless develop special tires for the P-34, perhaps we will know a completely different Formula 1. The P-34 idea was so good that the revolutionary car had followers. Even when Terrell abandoned his experiment due to insignificant tire performance, March, Ferrari and Williams developed their own six-wheel vehicles. The experiments ended in 1983, when the FIA banned excessive wheel counts. It will seem that what kind of struggle can arise with the dominance and great contribution of the American company Goodyear to the development of Formula One? However, for some leadership is a goal, but for someone the struggle for leadership is a goal itself. 
Michelin turned out to be such a company. Michelin, in addition to participation in the Paris European races, also created new products. Thanks to their revolutionary new wheel rim replacement, Michelin has reduced the time it takes to change their tires to just 1 minute 50 seconds. Frequent tire change, which Michelin riders spend four times less time on, gave them a head start. Not surprisingly, soon all the cars that stood at the start of the French Grand Prix were shoes with Michelin tires. It will seem that after such a triumph, the French company should have become the undisputed leader in auto racing. But the Michelin brother had another plan. Having reached the pinnacle of motorsport in Clermont Ferrand, they soon lost uh, interest in racing. The focus now was uh, on expanding production. The company staff has grown to 4,000 people. In 1907, the first Michelin factory outside of French was built in Turin, factories soon opened in London and in the United States. In addition, instead of racing cars, the imagination of Edward and Andrea was now captured by airplanes. Michelin began to invest huge sums in aviation. In 1908, having ceased participation in auto racing, the tire company established the Grand Prix and Michelin Cup for pilots. With the outbreak of the First World War, the Michelin brothers went even further. Already three weeks after the declaration of war, they offered the French government assistance in building a new bomber. And the first hundred aircraft undertook to be made free of charge. As a result, almost 2,000 aircraft and airships were built at the Michelin plant in Carme over the next four years. Somehow, it turned out by itself that Michelin talisman, the funny puffy man Bibendum, invented and drawn at the end of the 19th century by Edward Michelin, eventually turned into one of the symbols of technological progress. In 1913, in Clermont-Ferrand, they received a patent for a metal disc, a spare tire appeared on cars. Ten years later, Michelin still had it its tires with a metal cart, created low-pressure tires. And during the years of World War II, radial tires were developed. And here Bependum finally returned from the heaven to earth, and this return was grandiose. In 1977, the French were the first to design a racing version of radial tires, the course of which are located along the radius of the wheel. Bias tires used in F1 before had the course at an angle to the radius. By the time, this design had already penetrated the automotive industry, but Goodyear diagonal tires still dominated Formula 1. At the British Grand Prix, Michelin broke the Americans' natural monopoly. This change in production of racing tires has allowed teams to increase corner and spin, and even more power on straights by making them stiffer, less deformable, straight line stable, with better corner and grip and lighter weight. Radial tires uh, revolutionized F1, with performance from Michelin customers proving the superiority of innovation wheel step by step. Already in the 1971 season, French tire manufacturers won the first Grand Prix at the stage in the USA. Carlos Reitman from the Ferrari won. And although it was impossible to win the World Championship on the first try, the advantage of Colin Chapman's a car win was too great this season, and the Scuderia was too unstable after dismissal of Nicky Lauda. The very next year, Michelin won almost half of the grand prizes, the championship title and the Constructors' Cup to boot. That championship was won by another Scuderia driver, Jody Schechter. Moreover, in early 1981, the French even managed to oust such a tire monster as a Goodyear from the Grand Prix scene for several months and become F1 monopolists. However, Michelin's monopoly proved to be very short-lived. Encouraged by Goodyear's retreat, already at the fourth stage of the championship in Imola, Avon returned to Formula One, which had been absent since the late 50s. 
In the older, the Italian Borelli followed its example, and a month and a half later, at the French Grand Prix in Dijon Prenois, Goodyear again entered in the arena of big circles. The tall star war in the history of Formula One began between the USA Goodyear, Great Britain Avon, Italy Pirelli, and France Michelin. The importance of rubber became finally obvious to everyone, and really big money began to be invested in the development of tires. Almost every month, specialists from all four companies created improved formulations and conducted large-scale tests of them, incurring huge costs. Avon was the first to fail. In 1982, the English company left Formula One. But the other three companies were somewhat equalized. Lotus became the factory team of Pirelli, and Michelin signed a contract with Bernie Ecclestone's Brambam. The latter predetermined the outcome of the tire war. At most stages, including perhaps only urban roads, French tires behave slightly better than American ones. In addition of the top six teams in the World Cup, four Brambam, Renault, McLaren, and Alfa Romeo were now shot by Michelin. Therefore, it wasn't surprising that Michelin races made double in the board ship, having won nine Grand Prix along the way. Goodyear fans to Ferrari got the Constructors' Championship. But the next season put the last point in their confrontation. Already for the first race of the 1984 World Championship in Brazil, to replace last year's 705 tires in Clermont Ferrand, a new series of racing tires was prepared, designed in 22.05.05 for soft tires and 0.10 for harder ones. Both rubber types uh, had a slight advantage over Goodyear products, as did the qualifying tires. Of course, the superiority of French rubber wasn't absolutely over Hellman, but on almost all tracks, coupled with John Bernard's excellent McLaren chassis and the Tech Porsche turbo engine, this advantage brought victory. McLaren was AK Michelin's factory team. It was on machines of Ron Denis that the French tire manufacturer started their new products. It was far from modern computerization. All calculations were made on the basis of experimental data that were mined on the tracks. The same story with the Tolman team in Imola testified on how good Michelin's tires were. Prior to that, for five years Ted Tolman used Pirelli tires, on which he won the European F2 Championship in the 80s. And although the contract with the Italians wasn't officially renewed before the start of 1984, there was an agreement between Tolman and Pirelli according to which the team remained a client of the Italian company and provided it with its test base. And Pirelli generously paid for these tests. Just on Saturday before the race on the Imola, the Italians had to transfer 200,000 to the team's account to pay for tests in South Africa. However, due to internal problems, Pirelli management asked for a 10-day extension of payment deadline. But Ted and Alex Hockridge, who had long been looking for an excuse to defect to the Michelin's camp, immediately seized on the Italian's optionality and even printed Bernie Ecclestone to withdraw the team from the World Cup if they weren't allowed to change their supplier. As a result, after two weeks in Dijon, the cars of Ayrton Senna and Johnny Sicotta put on French tires, and in the next five races, Senna twice reached the podium. And while Michelin continued to win, spending on the racing program sucked more and more money out of the company. The constant success of the Michelin had led to the fact that their slightest failure was regarded as a big failure. For example, in Zolder and Dallas, the French Legion team stumbled. In Belgium, due to the constant engine breakdowns, McLaren couldn't properly set up the car on Friday. The team believed that the tuning problems could still be solved by putting medium tires on the car. However, this didn't help, as the engines of both cars burned out again early in the race. 
and Brabham and Renault cooling up with the Ferraris, who was shot in the latest Goodyear modification brought to the track by the Americans only on Saturday evening. The second failure awaited Michelin's in Dallas. At the stage in Dallas, the tender rubber of the French wasn't ready for the hellish Texas heat and asphalt crumbling before our eyes. On Saturday, participants in the Thapert races broke the asphalt so much that on Sunday night the builders had to fill in the potholes with cement. To allow the cutting and to harden, the Sunday warm-up was cancelled. But as soon as the race started, the asphalt in the first two turns began to crumble. Small and sharp pedal drills soft Michelin tires. Goodyear didn't suffer so much from stones. As a result of all French races, only Carrado Fabi reached the finish line on Brambam. And although Michelin continued to win further, but due to huge development costs, the perception of small failure is a big failure, the French left Formula 1 without waiting for their Waterloo. Michelin left the battlefield with his head held high. Brabham have won 14 of the 16 World Championship races. Even after the departure of Michelin, technical development in the field of tires didn't stop. In October 1985, a man named Mike Dury came to watch a Formula 1 race at Brent Hatch. The Englishman had his own business for the production of waterproof jackets. Looking at the competition with the fresh eyes of a man, far from motorsport, Dury saw that it was called for teams, drivers and tires to race on this October day. In the pits, the tires were wrapped in ordinary blankets, and on the warm-up lap, the races constantly wiggled along the track from side to side in order to somehow warm up the cold rubber. At the same time, the tires were out faster, and the pressure changed in the most unpredictable way. Judy decided that he can fix this, and he came up with hitting pads for tires. At first, no one looked at the invention seriously. When Drury offered his development to the Williams teams, the stable refused, and when, after much persuasion, they nevertheless accept the unknown device. They used tire blankets to heat computers. Only in the spring of 1986, at the Spanish Grand Prix, the racing team decided to try out heating pads in action. With 10 laps to go, Nigel Mansell pitted and got tires preheated with Drury blankets. Opening assured that the Briton had lost his chances of winning, lagging behind the leader by 90 seconds, but instead, Nigel immediately began to print fastest laps on warm rubber. After that, quills from Drury became necessary for everyone. Mike even found in a company that specialized in the manufacture of tire warmers. Today, this company supplies most of the World Cup teams with its products. By the way, an interesting fact. A set of four tire warmers cost about $3,400. Formula 1 teams require between 36 and 40 of these kits. However, the quilts are durable enough to use them for several seasons in a row. However, back to the tire wars which were subsiding at the time, in the mid 80s qualifying tires that collapsed after a couple of fast laps became widespread in Formula 1. And in 1991, season Goodyear lost its last competitor, Pirelli turned off the World Championship program. However, even getting rid of the tire wars didn't make the tires slower. The cars were going faster and there was more and more downforce. Powerful motors, the spread of electronics, Improving aerodynamics and growing downforce all led to the fact that the increase in speeds in F1 of 90s began to threaten the safety of racing. The FIA understood this and decided to slow down the cars by worsening their mechanical grip with the track, introducing tires with longitudinal grooves. New dyes with a smaller footprint couldn't deliver as much cornering spin as slicks, and F1 speeds did drop. 
Many people didn't like these decisions. The drivers and engineers had to deal with the rapid granulation and bumbling of tires due to overheating and get used to the new conditions. Moreover, the appearance of pack leaks caused many dissatisfaction. However, rubber with grooves lingered in F1 for 11 years. The monopoly of American rubber supplies in F1 lasted five years. In 1970, the Japanese company Bridgestone entered the championship. And at the end of the 98 season, Goodyear completed a long history in Formula One. From 1959 to 1998, American tire manufacturers held 494 Grand Prix, in which they won 368 victories, and drivers and teams using Goodyear products won 24 championship titles and 26 constructor cups. And these records won't be broken for many years. However, Japanese tire manufacturers didn't remain alone for long. In 2001, Michelin returned to the championship and immediately chopping off almost half of Bridgestone's customers, including Williams' BMW. After leaving F1, Michelin didn't leave racing. Over the next 15 years, the Claremont Ferrand based company won many victories in World Championship in Rally, Car and Sports Prototype. World Championship in Motorcycle Racing and Superbike. Few doubted that sooner or later one of the largest tire companies will definitely return to F1. And so the return took place. In Formula 1, an arms race between suppliers began again. Michelin and Bridgestone constantly upgraded the chemical composition of rubber and together with teams threw out tens of millions of dollars to test new tire specification. And despite the fact that more and more teams preferred to switch to French tires, Bridgestone customers from Ferrari won the championship. And this were defeats, with the exception of 2003 season. The secret of success was that the Excuderie was a priority team for Japanese. Their tires were developed according to the wishes of Ferrari and in close cooperation with the Italian team. Each composition was personally tested by Michael Schumacher. As soon as the Red Baron rejected the type of rubber that he didn't like, the guilty tires were instantly sent to a landfill. No one considering the efforts and money invested in development of such unsuccessful rubber. Whereas Michelin didn't single out any of its customers. 2005 brought new changes in regulation by FIA. Firstly, the development of field blankets went further, and already in 2005, Ferrari replaced the usual blanket with full fledged boxes where the whole field was placed. Comprehensive heating made it possible to achieve a uniform temperature in all parts of the tire, not only from the side of working surface and sidewalls, but also in the area where the tire articulates with disc. After such a tanning bed, the tire turned out to be in perfect condition. The qualifying results of Ferrari drivers instantly improved. The Scuderia holiday didn't last long. At the end of the season, the FIA banned hidden boxes, fearing of uncontrolled increase in costs. Now in Formula 1, only classic blankets are allowed. Secondly, in an attempt to somehow contain the growth of cost, drain the resource from teams and tire manufacturers, on the eve of 2005 season, the FIA forbade changing tires during the race. From now on, it was possible to call at the pit stop only for refueling. An indirect reason for the change was the desire to break the winning streak of Ferrari, whose dominance didn't benefit F1. It succeeded. The innovation instantly changed the balance of power. The Ferrari team that used Bridgestone lost its former advantage and Michelin customers got in the first position. However, not everything went smoothly for them either. Several times the French tires couldn't withstand the Grand Prix distance and explode shortly before the finish line, which led to the main scandal of 2005. 
The 2005 U.S. Grand Prix marked a turning point in long-lasting entire history. Unusual stresses experienced by Willis and Benkin at the Indianapolis track caused the Michelin tires to explode on Ralph Schumacher's Toyota in practice. In the paddocks, they started talking about the fact that it would be simply dangerous to start on such tires in race. The tires threatened to burst at the speed of over 300 km per hour in a frightened proximity to the concrete walls. It later turned out that the probable cause of explosion was too low tire pressure, which was set by Toyota engineers in pursuit of speed. And yet, no one wanted to take risks. After passing the warm-up lap, Michelin customers together headed to the pit stops where they spent the rest of the race. At the start of the US Grand Prix came six cars shoot in Bridgestone, whistling from stands, disgruntled promoters, sponsors and TV companies that Grand Prix caused great damage to the reputation of Bob, Michelin and Formula One as a whole. By the end of the championship, Everyone was dissatisfied with the ban. The German factories were unable to ensure the smooth operation of the tires throughout the race. The drivers didn't want to say the rubber reserves, and the spectators demanded the return of full flash pit stops. The fellow of the idea of a ban on changing tires didn't stop FIA. In order to contain rising costs, the Federation decided to leave only one rubber supplier. Another reason for this decision was the desire to ensure equal condition for participants. However, Michelin was only interested in victories won in competitive struggle. Shortly after the news of the introduction of a tire monopoly from the 2008 season, the French company announced the curtailment of the program in Formula One and eventually left the series at the end of 2006 having finally won titles in individual and team competitors with Renault. And Bridgestone became the sole supplier of rubber. Since then, Michelin was repeatedly declared its interest in F1, but only on the condition that competition between tire suppliers resumes. The next turning point in the history of Formula One was 2009. The problem of a small number of overtaking in F1 has been acute for years, and FIA took drastic measures to rectify the situation. Before the 2009 season, the technical regulation of Formula 1 experienced another revolution. To make the fight easier for drivers, all the small aerodynamic elements went under the knife, creating a lot of turbulence that made it difficult for the drivers to pursue. In general, the aerodynamics were significantly simplified, as a result of which the downforce level of the cars dropped sharply. As convinced by FIA, the improved mechanical grip was to compensate for the loss in aerodynamic efficiency, and 11 years later, slicks returned to F1. Bridgestone didn't remain a monopolist for long. Already in 2010, Japanese tire manufacturers decided to leave F1. Their departure wasn't particularly regretted. Bridgestone often accused of an overly conservative approach and two oak tires, which allowed them to stay on the track for an arbitrarily long time, which didn't have the best effect on entertainment. The point of reference from which the history of spectacular tires began was 2010 Canadian Grand Prix. At this stage, the traditionally very resistant Bridgestone rubber began to suddenly deteriorate very quickly. It was a complete surprise for both the tire manufacturers and the teams. As a result, the audience saw unpredictable race with a lot of overtaking and non standard tactical decisions. The F1 management liked the show so much that the new tire manufacturer Pirelli was asked to simulate Canadian Grand Prix effect. The Italian created the famous fast-breaking tires. New tires, as well as the introduction of DRS system, significantly increased the number of overtaken already in the 2011 season in some Grand Prix. Riders in total carried on hundreds and more successful attacks. 
In the first races of 2012 season, chaos reigned on the tracks at all. The teams didn't understand the work of tires prepared by Pirelli for that championship. As a result, in the first seven Grand Prix in 2012, there were seven different winners from five teams. At first, everyone liked races with abundance of pit stops and overtaken, but then irritation appeared. For most of the race, the drivers had to save tires and not attack at maximum. Many people in Formula 1 have come to the conclusion that the series is on the wrong track, and as a result, big changes were announced ahead of 2017 season, which also affected tires. In new Formula 1, the wheel has become larger. Speed of the front tires has increased by 60 mm and the rear tires have added 80 mm. Due to the increased contact patch, the level of mechanical grip increased. Thanks to this, as well as more advanced aerodynamics, the speed of cars and corners increased dramatically. And more importantly, Pirelli finally abandoned the concept of rapidly degrading tires and created a more or less very resistant rubber. In F1, you can again attack not thinking about saving tires. And now, 12 years later, the FIA announced a tender for the supply of tires for Formula 1. Who exactly will participate in this new competition is currently unknown. With a high degree of probability, we can assume that Pirelli will submit a new bid and retain a monopoly on supply of tires, as it was in the previous tenders. In the 2025 championship, the tire size will remain and in general many requirements will remain unchanged. One of the important conditions for the contestants will be the analysis of impact of tires on the environment. In particular, rubber manufacturers will be asked to demonstrate how they plan to organize the entire life cycle of a tire, from production to disposal. In addition, tires will need to be equipped with electronic uh, sensors to improve the efficiency of inspection procedures. However, at the moment, the main company that could challenge Pirelli in the tender is Michelin. The French concerns provide tires for a number of racing series, in particular MotoGP, the World Endurance Championship and Formula E. The French promoted the transition to 18-inch wheels even before the last tender held in 2018. Then they withdrew due to the FIA's decision to keep 13-inch rims and the requirement to develop fast braking tires in order to have two pit stops in most races for spectacle. The environment innovation required of the participants in new competition at Michelin are also able to surprise. In particular, in 2022, the company won the tender for the supply of tires for electric motorcycle Moto E, offering rubber for renewable raw materials. However, whether Michelin enters its third fight for leadership, we will know over time.